This is the second lecture of, um, of Jacob Adams on, um, on looking at legal protections of Native Alaskan handicrafts. He was here and he gave a lecture initially kind of outlining the broad parameters of the kind of protections that are, are available. Uh, he's conducted, he's been doing research since that last lecture. He's met with a number of artists. And in, a, in addition to that, we had a very lively session with our Council of Traditional Scholars. And of course, we've had a lot of great discussions. And I will tell you that I'm very excited about things that I've learned. Uh, I think we can see a glimmer of hope. And I know he's going to say more than a glimmer of hope in, in ways that we might be able to protect uh, some of our intellectual property. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob. Well, thank you, Rosita. And also, I want to extend my thanks to Sea Alaska Heritage for allowing me to be here for the, uh, the last couple months and for helping me to do my research and, and also to the community. Um, it's been uh, a great experience to be up here and be able to get out and talk to you know, many people and have learned so much. And I hope that, that this lecture will, will kind of lay out a bit of that. Obviously, I've been here for three months, so it's, it's an imperfect knowledge, but I'm, I'm getting there. And I think there are some pieces of it that, that you'll be able to see and expand upon. Um, I didn't know how many people uh, were going to be here that had been at my previous uh, lecture, and so I left the slides in from the last one um, just to kind of set the foundation, make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to blow through those very, very quickly. Uh, at the last lecture, we talked about, oh, Mary, you told me this was going to work. I was so excited. That's okay. The last lecture, I, I laid out foundations of intellectual property law, and uh, don't worry about it. Uh, looking at different mechanisms, uh, my specific area is looking at trademarks, so we went a bit deep into that. Uh, I started with the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. It's a special act that, that protects Indian-made artifacts and handicrafts in the U.S. I uh, looked at the market. Uh, for right here in Southeast Alaska, the conference did a good overview of the value of the handicrafts market and what section of that is attributable to uh, native handicrafts. 23% of the responding artists identified as native. They were making about 13,000 US dollars in income on their handicrafts, which is actually a higher proportion than the average artist in the area. Uh, I also went through market demands and pressures. Uh, we also have, you know, there's a huge demand for native made items. That's why people, a lot of people come up to visit areas that have native cultures, is to experience that and to essentially take a piece of that culture home with them. Uh, the pressures, of course, go hand in hand with that, that the more demand there is, the more opportunity there is for uh, unscrupulous manufacturers to take advantage of that. Uh, this works into the cultural survival element. This quote came from 1930s uh, when they started the, uh, the, Art, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act implementation. Uh, and this is what I, concerns me the most, is that without protection, without a protected way to utilize native handicrafts and to secure it, you may end up in a situation that the traditional knowledge that's attached to making those items could be lost because it's just not competitive to be in that market. Uh, basic value of a brand, of the actual trademark itself, these are massive numbers. The highest value piece of intellectual property in the world is a trademark. It's not a patent, oh, it works. It's not a copyright, it's a trademark. And this, uh, there are many different elements that go into this. It's the duration of it, it's the actual ability to protect identity, uh, it's the nature of our commercial world now that these are such valuable things. Uh, trademark basics. If there's one thing you have to remember about a trademark, it's an indication of origin. That's, that's all that it springs from. If there's something that can indicate the origin of something else, then that can be a trademark. Uh, basic types. This is where 
We went deep into trademarks last time, but it's important to understand the foundational aspects. Traditional trademarks is what everyone really understands. Logos, words, symbols. But there's more to it. There can be geographic identifiers. It's a type of trademark, in some places a quasi-trademark, that identifies a geographic area that's special for a certain thing. Like champagne, roquefort, parmigiano, tequila, all of those, you can only be called champagne if you come from that geographic area. And that's because that geographic area has something special that's integrated into that product. Roquefort cheese, they say it's aged in certain caves that have a certain uh, aspect to it, how it's aged and the taste that it gives it, those type of things. Uh, collective marks, used by people who are members of a club, essentially. If you're a member of the club, you can use the trademark. If you're not, you can't. Examples of this that I use are the alliances of airlines. The alliance itself is not an airlines, but the members of that airlines can use that mark to identify themselves as a member of that club. Collective marks, right, there's a good example. Sky Team and Delta, synonymous. I mean, they're, they're together. Delta is the airlines. It's using Sky Team to say, well, I'm a member of this, this club. If you fly on me, you're flying on a member of this club. Certification marks. They're kind of similar, but they don't attach to membership. They attach to a product or the attributes of something. So it doesn't matter who makes whatever is being certified. All that matters is, does it conform to the standard of certification? Examples of this are the underwriters laboratories. They certify a ton of stuff, a lot of safety related stuff. Originally started certifying electrical equipment. Uh, fair Trade certifies the source of raw materials and foodstuffs, essentially. Uh, Energy Star, CE is the conformity mark for the European Union. ISO, Microsoft, that uh, certifies hardware on which its programs can run. Uh, just examples of those in use. You can see here we have the CE and the Underwriters Laboratories lab, uh, Labs mark right on there. Uh, fair Trade, same thing. Certification of the Fair Trade. It's not, it, it doesn't take over the identity or the trademark of an entity. It's complementary to. Uh, I always say just for people who aren't real versed in trademarks, geographic identifiers, they protect the where of something. Certification marks, they protect the how. How was it made? And collective, they protect the who made it. Are they part of the club or not? Uh, general trademarks, this is where I'm looking at the nature of a trademark. It can be more than a logo. It can be more than just a word. Like in that truck, you have elements of trademarks that are integrated within that. You can look at the truck and even without the blue oval, you can recognize that it's a Ford. Well, those recognizable elements of it are trademarks in and of themselves. Uh, the bottle of a Coca-Cola, it's a good example because it's kind of inseparable from the product. If you take Coca-Cola out of this trademarked container, you end up with just brown liquid. And so it, it, the identity of that product is inseparable. The physicality of it might be separable. But together, they actually make that trademark identity. And there's the registration for it. Uh, Toblerone chocolate is a good one where the physicality and the trademark are inseparable from the product. The trademark in a Toblerone product is the shape of it itself. So if you see chocolate in a pyramid shape, either singly or you know, connected, it's going to be Toblerone. That's what they're protecting with that trademark. Anyone can make chocolate, but they can't make it like that because that's a trademark. Now, I said at the end of my last lecture, uh, why Southeast Alaska and what were my goals? Well, I chose Southeast Alaska because the indigenous groups in Scandinavia, Sami, and the Southeast Alaskan natives, they, they're very similar in, in size. They have very strong handicraft traditions. Uh, they face similar pressures from the tourism. Uh, a lot more tourism is being forced into the southeast Alaskan coast. Same with the northern coast of Scandinavia. 
And when that happens, a lot of the tourists come here specifically for that, that cultural element of their tourism. Not just to see the nature, but to experience the people. So the, the combination of Southeast Alaska and, Nor and uh, Northern Norway specifically, in my research, they're very complementary. My goals, I just read them again last night, understand handicraft arts, cultural expressions here, identify cultural expressions that lend themselves to this type of protection and foster an understanding of, of IP. The, uh, I, I was trying to think, how, did I achieve these? How do I go about that? And I, I thought just put up some, uh, those as the titles themselves of slides and see what I actually did. Uh, a few things that I learned. Cultural expo exploitation is still a huge problem. Uh, I learned that just from going out and experiencing it. Trying to buy something and figuring out, did I know whether this was authentic or not? I had a problem. Uh, also, the stories of others. I talked to a lot of native handicraft makers and they were lamenting the, the pressures and, of counterfeits and and non-genuine products on the southeast coast. More interesting to me is I talked to a lot of just my friends here who are non-natives. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of my friends who has lived here his whole life, he found out what I was doing and the first thing he said was, oh, I wish you could have been here 20 years ago. I wish you could have seen it when we didn't have these type of problems or at least it wasn't as serious. So this is a, uh, this cultural exploitation, it's, an issue that is not just a native issue. It's an issue for everyone who lives in this area. It, it affects everyone and it's important to everyone. Uh, you can see that also by in a month ago, four criminal cases were filed here in Juneau against shops in Juneau, Ketchikan, and Skagway. So there is still a problem here and the solution is not quite clear as to how we can stop this, this rampant cultural exploitation. And in my opinion also taking advantage of the tourists who don't have the ability to identify, don't have the education to really select native and non-native items. Uh, another thing that I learned, there is consistent opportunity for cultural misunderstanding. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just when you work in this area, there are clashes of cultures and educations and understandings that you might not expect. Uh, I speak, for the most part, the language of the law. And there's a cultural misunderstanding between me and almost any native speaker of, of English that doesn't work in law. If I t tell them intellectual property, people will think patents. If I, think, if I tell them trademarks, they might think copyrights. Uh, if I say the word conversion, they might ask, well, what does religion have to do with this? Where I'm talking about stealing. So even in my world of the law, there's a misunderstanding. Uh, that's compounded when you look at majority populations and native cultures and multiple languages as well, and then add a, la a layer of the law of, uh, the language of the law on top of that. Uh, and I, I highlight this because it's something that I try to be aware of when I do my research. To know that this will happen and to know that there are certain things that the background of it is actually more important than the word or the statement. And it takes trying to learn that to understand problems, issues, solutions, all of those type of things. Uh, this comes up in meaning of specific words. Uh, simple words that the translation of them may appear useful, but in fact are somewhat obtuse at the time. Uh, this leads into just a cultural education, that there's so much that is uh, that things are based upon that must be understood to understand a concept or a word. 
So there's always opportunities for that cultural education and exchange, and I find that hugely valuable. It's hugely valuable for me personally, but also in my area of trying to find legal solutions that you have to understand that kind of background to go about finding a solution that may work or be able to find a solution that you can say, well, it works, but not perfectly. There's more to be done here. Let's take an example from Scandinavia. <coughs> I'm dealing with uh, a trademarking system there for handicrafts for the Sami people. The word that's commonly used for handicrafts is dojji. But that's not what it means. That, that's what it means if you look in the dictionary, there's the translation. That's what it means if you talk to people. If you ask, what is Sami handicraft? They'll say it's dojji. But that's not what the word means. It, it's not what the word means in context or in culture. So it becomes a problem. I looked up in a couple of dictionaries and most of them would just say, Dodgy is handicraft. There's the translation to English. There was one that I found, though, that kind of realized there was this problem, and its definition was handicraft, accomplishment, achievement, feat, handwork, labor, work. And the reality is, yeah, it means all of those. Uh, the commonly used definition now for doji organizations and, and handicrafters is that doji is something traditionally made, uh, it's traditional Sami handicrafts or modern products, as long as it has a foundation in the culture, in tradition, and it's made by traditional materials. And critically, at the very end, it had a traditional use. And that goes to what the word actually means when it's being used. Doji originally was the word for items that were in common use at the time. Of course, that attaches to handwork and work because that's how these items were made. It also attaches to the materials because that's the material that the Sami people had to make these items. So things like knives and bowls, utensils, uh, wool clothing, all of those things are doji and they're identified as doji, but they're identified that way because of the past and the history of the item, how it fit into the culture, and how that word attaches to this whole area of you know, useful items. Now that's kind of been moved into a different area. Uh, and we'll look at some examples. These are all items of doji. There are two main divisions, hard items and soft items, textiles, uh, reindeer skin, those type of things. You can look at them, though, and, and think, I mean, that's beautiful handicraft. It has some very serious artistic ability there. But it's not art, strictly speaking, when you use the word doji. I'll go back to the previous slide, and this word, daida, it is the word for art. And in fact, it didn't exist until the 1970s because there was no concept of art for art's sake in the Sami culture. That didn't exist. There was no high art. There was no fine art. It, the concept just wasn't there. And so it was kind of forced into this idea of doji imperfectly. And then it was separated out into its own area. But then traditionally that grouping of doji became an artistic form. So if you look at these items, they're artistic, but remember that the, the root of doji was something that was used in everyday life. Some of these knives, most of them are very expensive, and so they're not used. They're bought and displayed. And you can see that by these examples. These are two very beautiful pieces of doji on each side. This I would still call doji in a traditional sense, but it may not fall into this current definition of doji that's being used for these items. So you can see that there's, when I say it was talking about cultural misunderstandings, for someone to walk into northern Scandinavia and ask about handicrafts, they'll be told, well, it's doji. You need to go talk to some doyers, some makers of doji. But without understanding that entire landscape 
of what that word actually means and how it's evolved and how it relates to various items. It's very difficult to actually understand what is going on and what the problems are. And we have a similar situation in Southeast Alaska. At ooh, I was told when I came here first, oh, protection of property, you know, uh, handicrafts, items. Well, you're talking about at ooh. I thought, all right, I'm on my way. Now I, I, I understand it. I should have been smarter. I should have, I should have known from my experience of doji that this was way too simple. And it turned out, of course, it is. Atu does not mean what you know, it says in the dictionary. It, it, it doesn't have, it's not as easy as just having a definition. It's much more than that. Uh, I stole a little bit of Rosita's work to give you some definitions. Uh, defined as tangible property, including land, physical structures, ceremonial and sh shamanic objects, warrior armor, weapons, utilitarian objects. Also, it includes intangible items as well. And those intangible items can attach to the tangible. So embodiments of Atu, like when people are discussing clan crests, names, uh, crests other than expected, those are crests that I found and thought, wow, that's, that's not, that's something totally different but it works completely into this concept of atu. When you look at the embodiments, someone will say, oh, well, they're from this clan and our crest is a bear, let's say. Well, the crest is not that depiction of a bear. It's actually attached to the intangible concept of the bear as well. The ownership of that crest extends both beyond that physical embodiment and also to multiple interpretations of it as well. This actually fits quite well within a con an understanding of the, the social structure and society that these items of Atu were entitlements to concepts and, and uh, spiritual type of things that, uh, as identification but they were also used as uh, trading items and value, and they, they had so much more attached to them, identity and uh, cultural cohesion. So in the intellectual property sense, when I'm looking at these things, it's kind of difficult to fit either intellectual property into Atu or fit Atu into an intellectual property Western structure. That doesn't mean that there isn't, as I said in the title, fertile ground here for intellectual property protection. Uh, one thing that I attempted to do, and I think I got into it, was understand the culture. You know, look broadly at these distinctive elements that make the natives of the Southeast Alaskan coast and the Northwest coast make them unique. You know, what is it that, when I look at it as a trademark attorney, what are those distinctive things that set this group of people apart? Uh, there's a lot of distinctive stuff. There's a lot of stuff that is unique to this area and the people that traditionally are the owners of this area, this land. Uh, but it fits, you have a, things like aesthetic uniqueness, uh, four-line design, the artistic expressions, how they're applied to certain... Uh, depictions and, and uh, utility items. But all of those are, are kind of centered also in a, in a traditional sense. How do they fit into the culture? How do they fit into the stories? Where did these items come from? They also, important for me, fit into a historical context of can I trace a lineage of the use of these things? Kind of outside of this, uh, this cultural narrative can I just trace the use of them? And most of the items that are distinctive in this area have all of these, these elements. They're aesthetically unique. They're identifying. They have a cultural connection to something greater. Uh, and they have a historical connection of continued use for, as they say in indigenous uh, rights law, time immemorial. 
Uh, one thing that I was, uh, one goal that, that I was trying also was to identify certain items that would lend themselves to certain protection in a Western intellectual property scheme. Uh, perhaps before we go into this, I should uh, mention as well with that cultural misunderstanding in those, those uh, culturally unique areas, the convergence of those areas causes uh, protection to, to never be perfect. Uh, you have a, a Western intellectual property scheme in trademarks that can trace its way back to statutes in the you know, mid-1800s. Uh, in the common law back to the 1600s. The, the basis for that is an entirely different cultural understanding than the property rights, the rights to clan crests, the intangible uh, elements in a native culture. So when I try to identify items that can be protected, they, it never quite fits. I can never say, well, this is how we protect Adul. It, it takes kind of removing yourself from the native context and from the Western context and finding discrete points, saying for this, there is a manner we can protect that. For something else, there's also a manner, but it doesn't relate to Adu, just like Doji does not relate to handicraft perfectly. Protections don't relate to the entire concept of Adu or Doji in a native context. Some of the ideas that I had though, certification marking for native made products. One of the biggest problems that we have in the commercial area, especially in the tourism area, is the ability to identify genuine and non-genuine products, whatever they may be. As you, know, you could see from the first little part of my lecture, if you were keeping up with how fast I was going, and with my first lecture, there's a way to do that. Certification marking certifies the attributes of a product, whatever those attributes may be. You could have a mark that certifies something is made by a specific clan. That's perfectly possible. Or a specific clan in a certain geographic area, also possible. Or generally, Clinket people, or Clinket Haida and, and Simshan. All of that's possible because you can write the certification standards however you choose to do so. There, another idea was certification for cultural integrity. One thing that certification marking can do is set standards for what is appropriate or for what is uh, a true depiction of something. We'll get into that, it'll be a little clearer. Clan crests as embod embodiments as collective marks. Remember, collective marks, they can be used by someone who's part of a group, a collective. When I was uh, researching into the clan structure and the clan crests as they attach to that, that to me looks like a perfect structure of a collective marking system. The only difference is that when we're talking about a collective mark, it's the depiction of a, of a crest, not the crest itself that would be protectable. So you again have to separate this idea of crests being at u and a depiction of a crest being protectable in a, uh, in a collective marking system. I also picked out a few items that are so unique to this area and these people that you could look at them as a trademark protectable item. When we were looking at the different forms a trademark could take, that it could be integrated into a product, or like Toblerone, it can actually be the product, essentially. The identity and the physicality can be inseparable. Some items of, of heritage for the Southeast Alaskan natives are like that. They are so distinctive that you could say the identity and physicality of the trademarking are inseparable. Let's look at uh, well, certification marking of native products, I think everyone understands that, but let's look at certification as cultural integrity. There's something that came up a few months ago that perfectly embodies this. And it's such an odd way of going about it, but makes sense to everyone, that if we apply it to a native context, it makes it much more clear. 
sushi. There are all these complaints about sushi, that it's not Japanese, that the California roll wasn't Japanese, that all of these things. So Japan as a country decided we want to protect the integrity of sushi. Sushi was, uh, was recognized as a piece of intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO in 2013. So there's already the recognition that this is something unique, that this is something that attaches to a culture. And to combat the, uh, I would say, the, the dilution of sushi as a piece of cultural heritage, they've decided to set up a certification system. And al although the specifics haven't been worked out particularly, registrations haven't been sent to government offices, this is a certification marking system. And that's the way that it will be implemented, that someone will be trained, someone will have the knowledge to, to maintain the integrity of sushi as a Japanese traditional food. And then they'll be able to use a certification mark to identify their knowledge and their use of that traditional food to the public, to the consuming public. This came out and, you know, people said, this is a great idea, right? That, yeah, there's still the ability to go get your sushi burrito, but it will be identified in the negative as not being traditional. Yet, when we talk about this in a native context, People will say, well, you know, why would we do that? How can we do that? That doesn't seem possible. Well, it is possible. It, it, the standards are there. It's happened. It's happened even in a context of cultural integrity. So all of those elements are there to be implemented in a, in a larger scale or even in a smaller local scale. If we look at certification marking as a protector of integrity for something that's culturally valuable here, the first thing that came to my mind was form line design. It would be difficult to say that form line is a trademark because it's a system. It's, it's an artistic expression, right? It's, it's like cubism or realism. Uh, although it's unique and it's very distinctly from this area and from the people in this area, it still sits in that world of art and copyright that makes it difficult to protect. But there are rules to this art form. There are rules that, that come from antiquity that were passed down and there are certain ways to do form line art. That, to me, seems pretty close to the protection of sushi. If we go one step further, to me, that looks like the four line equivalent of a sushi burrito. That you can kind of see where they started. You can kind of see what they've taken to make these artistic elements, or these, are, you know, these, these pieces of art. But to say this is four line is to say that a sushi burrito is sushi. The landscape is there. The environment's there to set up a system not to combat these type of items, but to protect the integrity of cultural heritage, of the form line design, just like you would, or just like the Japanese are going to do with sushi. When another uh, item that I looked at, we're gonna step from the certification system and collective system and move into actual trademarks. Uh, as I said before, the trademark can be much more than just the logo or the word or the design, but can be inseparable from the actual product itself. And when I was thinking about that, I uh, was walking around trying to find <coughs> first items that were being misused. Because one of the perfect areas that this kind of slots into is that area of misuse, that area that you have multiple items being made merely for consumers or for tourists so they can take a little piece of the culture home. And one item that I thought lends itself to this type of protection is the Tana. It has 
historical connections. It has a consistent design. It has a connection centered in the culture with, with stories and all these other items. It's also very distinctive in its construction, in its design, in all of these things. When you see it, you know where it comes from, or rather you should. Here's one that I had made for me from a traditional designer. And he, he made that for me really just to show the difference between one that's not a genuine Tana. And I actually have both of these up here, if anyone like wants to see them. But there are very distinct differences between these two items. One is traditionally made in a traditional manner, all of these things. One I can definitely tell, you know, is a genuine article. The other one, thankfully I've had the education and I have people that I can ask to know that it's not genuine. But when you're looking at these two pieces, or rather, not when you're looking at them, when someone steps off of a cruise ship and they walk into a store and they decide they want to take a piece of traditional, you know, Southeast Alaskan native culture home. And then maybe they're looking at earrings or a necklace pendant or whatever it may be. Can they tell the difference between those two? That's the question. In my opinion, something as distinctive as that, if someone looks at it, they should be confident that they know where it comes from. They should be confident that they know who made it because it is an indicator of source. That shape, that design, how it's made, all of those things are taken directly from the culture. It, it's part of the culture. Anything that's made to look like that, especially if it's made to look like that merely to be sold to you know, uneducated consumers, that's an exploitation. That's the very definition of it. So if we look at these items, and instead of looking at them as aesthetic resources, but looking at particularly the Tana'a as a trademark, as a piece of property that is owned by the native people in this area and was owned, then the narrative changes. It no longer becomes a distinction between let's identify what is and what is not genuine, but let's look at a genuine piece and a counterfeit, right? A piece of property and something stolen. Uh, looking at those specific designs, you may say, well, that, I don't know, that's, that's, it's just a shield or it's just a tana. I mean, it doesn't have that distinctive element. It, it does, though. And there are examples, even in the commercial world, of <coughs> similar designs or just a shield being very, very distinctive and being jealously guarded. Here we have Captain America's shield. That's pretty distinctive, especially now with all the movies. People would look at that and say, yeah, I know what that is. You have the Victorinox shield, which is the, one of the makers of the Swiss Army knife, right? Jealously guarded. You have this one I put on. I, I don't think that it's a registered trademark, but to any movie going person, it's pretty distinctive as the shield that the Spartans use in the film 300. And in the lower right, you have the Ferrari logo. No words, just designs, all shields or some variation of it. In the commercial world, this is perfectly acceptable because you relate this back to the foundations of trademark law. Is it distinctive enough? to be an indicator of source? That's the question. And that's the only question. If I look at it and it's distinctive enough to tell me where something came from, then that has the ability to be a trademark. So looking back at the Tana'a, is it distinctive enough? I think it is. Nowhere else in the world do you find it. Anyone else who's making it that's a non-native is making it purely to take advantage of that status as distinctive. So we're coming to the end and that was my last goal in 
my previous presentation was try to foster an understanding of IP. And I don't know if I did that. That's all up to you. But I hope that by going through all of these different uh, kind of legal areas and looking at you know, the practical areas and trying to apply those, I hope I've uh, kind of given you some, uh, you know, some articulation of the problems here. I've given you some inspiration on some solutions and hopefully a better understanding of the law and how intellectual property works and what there is in intellectual property that can be used in a native context. So, that's all I have. Are there any questions? You have another three months. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, another, what, two weeks at this point. <laughs> no, for questions. Oh. Another 30 years. <laughs> Jacob, I guess in thinking of the, the concept of certifications and um, for for art object and other properties, um, um, I'm just trying to think through the if this was something that Clinkets or Alaska Natives or Native Americans um, wanted to pursue, um, uh, would it? be more advantageous for each uh, tribe or, or each um, band. Um, so, so, as, so should the Clinkets go after their own type of certification or should Alaska Natives protect you know, all of uh, Alaska Native art and then take it a step further, should there be, you know, is, is it, or is it more advantageous to look at a, a national um, certification you know ideally there would be national protection for this uh, ideally that would be a private type of protection there are of course like the Indian Arts and Crafts Act that tries to fill this hole a little bit you have the Alaskan Silver Hand program that also tries to fill this hole but but on the government side you know in a statutory manner ideally there would be a certification organization nationwide and there would be a unified mark that everyone could recognize. The practicality of that is an entirely different question. Uh, you have you know, a, a disparity of resources for different tribes. You have a, a disparity of, of administration, um, structuring. I mean, you have so many problems with that. So I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that question, but what I can say is, if there is an area that it can be done in, it should be done, right? And if, if it's here in the southeast, I mean, I think it would be something that would be easily implemented. Alaskan-wide, it probably could, right? Uh, so if there's an area where it would function and it could happen, then do it, right? So it would need to be a regional entity like the Alaska Heritage Institute. You know, we could, <coughs> the questions on, on structuring and responsibilities, uh, it could be anyone. I mean, we, we could talk days and days about how it should look, you know, who has which rights and that. Uh, it could be an it can, entirely independent organization in Switzerland. I mean, it doesn't matter because what matters is the standard, right? And if we were looking at like a national organization, ideally the best thing would be a completely disinterested, apolitical party, group, nonprofit, that only had one goal, and that was we certify. You send it in, we certify it. We don't care about identities, we don't care about ethnicities, or you know, political questions. We look at the standard, and that's it. So underwriters laboratories could do this? Underwriters laboratories definitely could, and in fact, in the last couple of years, they've moved, it, moved into certifying uh, lifestyle things. Like uh, they have something called the, the Echo logo, the UL Echo logo, which certifies you know, uh, ecologically sourced things. They have, so they're moving into these kind of green marks as well, which is a step removed from their safety and electrical type of things. 
But in reality, any organization could do it. Uh, not for now, but um, I don't know much about the Sangat way of life, but I'd be interested to hear what the cultural scholars had to say. When you spoke about the language of the law, it brought to my mind the way of Sangat life, law, Sangat law. And I'm wondering if there is an opportunity for this to be brought to the UN because it's Sangat law. And it's not by boundaries, by geography. It is the law. It doesn't fit into Western law. Sangat law rules. And so there's no way you can apply Western law onto the Sangat way of life. And is there some avenue that can be recognized worldwide as worldwide <coughs> as Sangat law? I don't know anything about Simsian or Haida. They use the same northwest coast geometric form line design. Similar, I don't know much about that form, which many Sangat elders do not favorably call it art. It is at U. And so your, your comments on that? I, I see where you're going. Uh, and it's a complicated answer. Uh, and you're right in one aspect that this is, as I started with, it's an imperfect type of thing. We're trying to bridge a divide, not only between languages and cultures, but also legal systems. Uh, but a lot of people have in their mind that going to something like the UN, it, it, that it has some power, right? that it has some overarching legal ability to come down and wave the wand and make it right. That's not the reality. Even if there's an agreement at the UN, the United States consistently has not signed those. The international system is not a system that forces law on people or on nation states. It's one where nation states decide that they want to be, you know, integrate that law into their system. So, even if we were able to achieve something at an international scale, it would still depend on domestic implementation. And I'm not saying that that's not a good route to go. There is a lot of work being done at the international level, and there are a lot of amazing indigenous scholars that are putting a lot of effort into sorting out these questions and protecting the rights of indigenous people worldwide. But to merely focus on that would be to ignore solutions that are available at the moment. At the moment, we have millions of dollars of stuff being sold in this area to people who can't tell the difference between native and non-native. We have millions of dollars that are being funneled not only out of the native community by exploiting the, their cultural heritage, but being funneled completely out of the state. There's a solution to that. And yes, there should be advocacy at an international level, but that should not be to the detriment of using the tools that are available now to fix discrete problems at the moment. It also furthers the entire indigenous rights field by implementing those things. It's saying, here's a system that's being used successfully by Western commercial entities, and we can use it too. It's, it's putting indigenous rights at the same level, and that's really where we should start from. Does that make sense? May I ask, uh, the protecting the integrity of regalia, um, Finland, do, are you familiar with how they've structured their system and law? Uh, Finland is, is uh, unique. Uh, Finland, I think I spoke about it in the last lecture, they have a certain city called Rovaniemi, and it is known for exploitation of the Sami culture. Uh, there are many, many interesting problems with indigenous rights, with the Sami rights in Finland. Uh, what I can tell you is that the protection of Sami regalia, like the Sami Gakti, uh, the Sami Kofta, in Finland is on a very loose foundation at the moment.
maybe I could just comment. Uh, you know, you you asked a really good question, and we had a really good discussion with our council of traditional scholars. And I'll, I'll tell you, there was really differences of opinion. Uh, it was a really heated discussion. And um, uh, what I guess what we were trying to do is we were trying to look for ways that we could protect intellectual property rights. And then Chuck and I had a really good discussion about why haven't we been able to do it. We've had a, we've had a national group, uh, uh, iPinch, that's been working on intellectual property for indigenous people uh, throughout the world. And we, it was a several years long research project. And in the end, we came up with nothing. You know, you know, there was lots of discussions, but I don't think we came up with this is a this is a path. And I and I, I think it was because it was just primarily anthropologists talking without lawyers. There were some lawyers, but we really didn't. We weren't looking at the existing legal regimes in the United States. And uh, and maybe it was because you know when we were trying to resolve uh, our Aboriginal land claims. You know, we knew exactly what our law is. I mean, uh, Clinkett law is built around clans, but but the United States said no. You know, you can't you can't use uh, the Teton was an example where you can't uh, file by clans. You have to file by Clinkett people, and they actually reversed their position a couple of times. But we ended up going for for uh, we knew the concept of Aboriginal title. We understood that. We understood Western law. And um, and we also wanted to make sure that we didn't follow the Laurel 48's model with trust lands. I mean, we have now some uh, people in our community in, uh, in Alaska that are wanting to go back to trust lands. But we said we wanted to, we as a Native community said we wanted to have absolute control of our land. We didn't want to have the Bureau of Indian Affairs telling us what we could do or couldn't do. So we went with corporations, and and uh, the corporations have fostered a lot of distrust, you know, because it doesn't recognize clan rights. And but you know, so we we're kind of coming around trying to figure out how how we as corporations can can recognize clan rights. And we just had a meeting yesterday. We can't. We the clans are not legally structured, so we ended up going with the tribes. So I don't know if we're going to come to have another issue. But we keep searching for these ways to recognize our rights. And, uh, and, and so we have a lot of like distrust right now of, of different institutional forms that are not traditional. And, um, but we keep searching. But, and, but, and we had actually, our, our, our session was a debate. And, and I said, we, right now we have absolutely no protections for our intellectual property rights. And, uh, but we have to deal, we as, as a Native community, we're looking for the solutions. We, uh, and right now we've seen a possible vehicle for it. But we as a Native community have got to figure out how do we want to do it. <coughs> but to me, I, I'm seeing a glimmer of hope here. We, there are some legal mechanisms uh, where we could try to protect some of the forms. I'm not going to give up on the form line yet, I'll tell you. you know, I thought if we could go with the OVOI, uh, the split U, and then the rules that, you know, that integrate them, I kind of, I kind of moved on a little step further. Because first I said just the form line, the basic, uh, the basic split U, the OVOI, uh, those designs. But then I was trying to think, and he said no, he thought, oh, that would be a long time coming, you know. And, but we said, let's put it on our strategic plan to look for it. And then now I'm thinking, you know, there are these specific rules of that you know, really defined rules about the interrelationships between those uh, components of form line. So I think, it's, but to me, it's really exciting because it's given me some uh, hope for direction. Whereas before, I, I just came off of this intellectual property uh, organization research for about three years with nothing. So I, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll expand on that. To Rosita, that, that my research and what I'm, you know, t trying to clarify, it's not really a protection of indigenous rights. It can't do that. Mm -hmm. It is identifying items. It's identifying mechanisms in the Western law.
that can be utilized for very certain things. You know, problems with, uh, with handicrafts that are being exploited for the tourism trade. This offers a solution to that. To protect the integrity of items like the Tana'a, make sure they're made properly, that the traditional knowledge remains for how to make them, and to make sure that there's this economic channel that's funneling money back where it should go to the people who this is an identifying symbol of them. So it, it's really not a broad discussion of indigenous rights. It's discussion of a very particular set of circumstances in which this works. But it's also a very powerful area. Uh, trademarks, as I said, it protects that identity. No other area of intellectual property does this. And so far, the identity of indigenous groups has not been really considered to be in this, underneath this umbrella, but it is. Uh, the other thing, looking at uh, the international side of this, there are groups that are working on intellectual property protection of indigenous rights at the international level. One of the huge complications, though, is you have to figure out something that would work for everyone. Are the natives of the southeast Alaskan coast the same as those in Papua New Guinea? or Melanesia, or Central Africa? Do they have the same problems, the same concerns? Do they have the same you know, cultural elements? It's, it's a huge problem to try to draft something internationally that will, will resolve all these concerns. Uh, and in fact, the, the World Intellectual Property Organization's group that's looking specifically at this is still having trouble trying to find out a definition for indigenous. So, you know, it's work that needs to be done, and it's, it's work that, it's valuable, but not to the exclusion of on the ground, in the area, regional, domestic, implementation of rights. Or I should say recognition of rights that already exist. And that's what we're talking about in this area. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank Jacob, you know, for coming here. Um, this is a visiting scholars program, and we've been fortunate in having uh, uh, individuals like Jacob, the caliber of researchers uh, working on his PhD. He's already got two law degrees. Uh, we've had other people come and talk about, you know, do research on energy, just a whole a range of research. And, but one of the requirements is that they give us, you know, these lectures so that we could have immediate benefit, you know, uh, of their research. So uh, we've been really fortunate that, you know, I think this is a milestone for us, Jacob, uh, in your work, because I, I really do think it's giving us, you know, another vehicle to look at. I mean, something that's been there in front of our nose and we haven't utilized it. So I really do want to thank you for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you.